My name is Christopher Chalens. I'm the Dean of the College at Georgetown uh, University here. And I think uh, we're so happy about this wonderful event that is sponsored by uh, three different entities. The Georgetown Humanities Initiative, which is something we're building in the College of Arts and Sciences, uh, our Georgetown Library, and the Future of the Humanities Project here at Georgetown. Um, on that latter uh, uh, front, I want to thank very heartily Dr. Michael Scott, who's a senior advisor to President DeJoya for being here. I'd also really like to thank Professor Catherine Temple from our English department. And it gives me great joy to introduce tonight Professor Nicola Gardini, who is a professor of Italian and comparative literature at Oxford University. He is uh, a tremendously multidimensional uh, intellectual thinker and writer. Um, having completed his laurea, his, his degree in classics in Milan, he went on to receive a PhD in comparative literature at NYU. He's taught many places until he's now been in Oxford for quite some time. Uh, he has written across many different realms, across the academic realm, across the realm of fiction, and uh, prose fiction, and of course poetry. So in terms of academic writings, just a few things that stand out that are relatively recent. There's so many that I'm not going to read them all because I want him to have the floor. Uh, he's done translations from Latin into Italian, such as his recent I Carmi di Catullo, the poems of Catullus, which came out with Feltrinelli in 2015. His, um, uh, his work, La Cuna, Saggio sul non detto, a book about absences in literature. Uh, per una biblioteca indispensabile from Ainaudi, which came out in 2012, a series of works that are essential to think about, and a wonderful sum, a kind of synthetic work called Rinascimento, Re Renaissance, which came out with Ainaudi in 2010. Then on the fiction side, uh, he's published a series of novels, such as La Vita Non Vissuta, which came out with Feltrinelli in 2015, uh, there was an English translation of one of his novels that won a prize that came out called Lost Words that came out in 2015, um, a novel called I Baroni with Feltrinelli in 2019. And again, I'm really just giving you the last sort of five or six years, basically. I mean, there's so many more things he's published. In poetry, I would note his volume Stamattina from 2014, Le Parti dell'Amore from 2010. So we're really, we're really dealing here with a multidimensional thinker whom we're privileged to have. He's been working uh, in and around the, the idea of the Latin language, the usage of the Latin language, the way it infiltrates a lot of what we do, how we think. Um, he published a book called uh, Viva Latino a while back, and he, uh, he has a work coming out in English called Long Live Latin very soon. And that's the work he's going to be talking to us about tonight. Um, I, I'm so pleased to welcome him. He, we will have a lecture from Professor Gardini, and then we'll have ample time for uh, questions and conversations afterwards. So please join me in welcoming Nicola Gardini to the stage. Good evening, everyone. I am delighted and honored to be in Georgetown and, um, uh, and to be speaking about Latin. So uh, thank you very much for this a wonderful invitation. Um, let me express my gratitude to everyone who's been involved in, in this uh, event, uh, starting from um, Professor Tom Banchoff and, uh, and uh, Professor Michael Scott, and uh, of course, uh, Professor Christopher Celenza. Uh, but um, you know, without further ado, because I think um, I have a pretty tight uh, schedule, let me start with a, with a, you know, a few remarks on why we need Latin, why we love it, or we should love it. <laughs> Latin is the language of ancient Rome and the civilization that took root there, expanding through the centuries to cover a remarkably vast territory, the so-called empire. It became a means of expression and communication for a large part of mankind on the page and in the public sphere serving even in the modern age, long after spoken Latin forked into distinct tongues and loaned thousands of terms to Germanic languages such as English as a means of expression for poets, intellectuals, and scholars across various disciplines. Latin is the language of our legal institutions, of architecture, engineering, the military, science, philosophy, worship, and the florid literature, which served as a model for all Western literature in the centuries to follow. 
No field of knowledge or linguistic creativity exists which has not been expressed in Latin with superb and exemplary skill. Poetry, epic, elegy, epigram, etc., etc., oratory, comedy, tragedy, satire, personal and official letter writing, the novel, history, dialogue, along with, the, uh, with moral philosophy, physics, jurisprudence, the culinary arts, the theory of art, astronomy, agriculture, meteorology, grammar, medicine, technology, systems of measurement, and religion. Through literature in hundreds of masterpieces, Latin speaks of love and war, explores body and soul, proposes theories on the meaning of life and the duty of the individual, the destiny of the soul, the structure of matter. It sings the beauty of nature, the greatness of friendship, pain at losing what we love. It challenges corruption, meditates on death, on the arbitrary nature of power, on violence and cruelty. It constructs images of our inner states, gives shape to our emotions, formulates ideas about the world and about civil life. Latin is the language of the relationship between the one and the, man and the many, of the complex confrontation between freedom and constraint, between private and public, between the contemplative life and the active life, between province and capital, between country and city. And it is the language of responsibility and personal duty, the language of inner strength, the language of property and of will, the language of a servitude that questions the abuse of power, the language of mourning. Intention speaks Latin. Protest speaks Latin. Confession speaks Latin. Belonging speaks Latin. Exile speaks Latin. Memory speaks Latin. Latin is our most striking monument to the civilization of the human word and to faith in the possibility of language. To speak of Latin is first and foremost to speak of a complete dedication to organizing one's thoughts in a profound and measured discourse to select meanings in the most pertinent manner possible, to arrange one's words in a harmonious order, to give verbal evidence of even the most fleeting states of our inner self, to believe in verbal expression and in demonstration, to record the contingent and the transient in a language that survives beyond all circumstance. I fell for Latin at an early age. I'm not exactly sure why. When I try to make sense of it, all I can ever dig up is a memory or two, not necessarily linked to any reason. It's hard to explain an instinct, a calling. Latin helped me excel in my studies, find my way toward poetry and literature, fall in love with translation. It gave, me, it gave my diver, divergent interests a common goal. In the end, it's even earned me a living. I taught Latin at the new school in New York, at one high school in Lodi, uh, near Milan, and another in Milan. And even now, at Oxford, where I teach Renaissance literature, I use this language every day because there's no such thing as the Renaissance without Latin, and Professor Celenza taught this to the world with at least a couple of important books. Growing up, I wielded it like an amulet or a magic shield, a bit like Stendhal's Julien Sorel in The Red and the Black. When I went to my rich friends' houses in Milan, where I grew up, I always made a good impression precisely because of my reputation as a good Latin student. And later, with my brand new classics degree in hand, when I began a doctorate in comparative literature at NYU, it was my knowledge of Latin that American professors valued most. It was the early 90s, probably today, I don't know. If, 
I would be, I, I might be as lucky as I was then. <laughs> Only the, maybe in this university, yes. Only then, in that American world, I should say in this American world, not too far from here, where who you are yourself matters more than your parents' surname, did I understand how fortunate I was. Thanks to Latin, I was never alone. My life stretched for centuries and across continents. If I've done any good for others, I've done it through Latin. And whatever good I've done myself, that without question, I owe to Latin. Studying Latin set me in the habit early on of thinking about language in terms of discrete sounds and syllables. It taught me the importance of musical language, the soul of poetry. At a certain point, words I'd used every day began disassembling in my mind and swirling around like petals in the air. Thanks to Latin, every word I knew doubled in sense. Beneath the garden of everyday language lay a bed of ancient roots. This is true of Italian and the other Romance languages, but it also applies to English, whose vocabulary is mostly derived from Latin, either directly or through French. The double origin of the English vocabulary is obvious in the different roots of semantically related nouns and adjectives. Consider, for example, the pairs sun, S-U-N, sola, moon, luna, tooth, dental. The noun is Germanic, the adjective is Latin. Even the most Germanic sounding word may have sprung from Latin. Take laundry, such an American word. <laughs> it derives from the old French la vanderie, which derives from the Latin gerundiv lavandum, that which must be washed. It makes perfect sense, no? The same root, lave, wash, is to be found in lavatory or even in lavish, taken from the old French, lavas, deluge of rain. Hence the notion of abundance, which originally applied to speech. We now forget that there is a connection between, say, a lavish banquet, an overflowing amount of water, and an excessive discourse. But the connection, a metaphorical one, is definitely there. If, on the one hand, this multiplicity of meanings requires an understanding of history and a faith in even the most remote connotation, on the other, it makes one alert to insidious nuance, to the splendor of figurative speech, and therefore to ambivalence, elusiveness, mystique, and the gift of saying two or even three things at once. I was drawn to Latin as a child because it was ancient, and I've always loved antiquity. Or to put it more accurately, certain images of the ancient world have always given me a special pleasure. The pyramids, or the columns of Greek temples, or the Egyptian mummies, I also recall a passage in my elementary school textbook about the domus, the house of patricians, and the insulae, where everybody else lived. My family and I, I discovered, lived in an insula. It wasn't until my second year of middle school that I came to own an actual book in Latin, and there it was the domus, described in detail. Alongside, it was a wealth of architectural terms, my first Latin words. Impluvium, atrium, triclinium, tablinum, vestibulum, fauces. I then overlooked the fact that this terminology came from a book by Vitruvius, one of the most influential figures in history. Who would have dreamt a house that let the rain in through a hole in the roof and collected it in a basin below? 
that had columns and rooms atop rooms, a house so big you could hide in it and never be found. So yes, Latin became entangled with my desire to, in a certain sense, climb the social ladder. The dream of a magnificent house. More precisely, it became a space in my imagination where I could live happily, the happy place. And it wasn't solely internal, this place. Uncontainable, it slipped out of me into my drawings. Everywhere I could, I sketched plans for this domus, filling in every box with its proper Latin, Latin term, certain that I too, one day, would have my own domus. My apprehensive parents, I, can, I come from a working class family, tried to justify the habit by saying I'd grown up to be an architect. For many people, Latin is useless. I won't enter into discussion on the meaning of utility, a concept with variations and stratifications that go back to antiquity and to philosophy, which itself would, would merit an entire speech. What I will say here, however, is that those many people, civilians, politicians, professionals in every field, have a sadly and dangerously limited idea of education and human development. What they believe in the end is that knowledge amounts to know-how, the immediate adaptation of thought toward a practical aim. But if that were the case, knowledge would hardly be useful. We'd have surgeons, plumbers, and not much else given that machines are growing more and more responsible for satisfying our primary needs. Eventually, the surgeon or plumber will disappear too, and if such is the fate of knowledge, that it be surrendered to machines, or as we put it more often these days, to technology, what exactly will there be for human beings to know? Of course, we'll have to learn how to build the machines and keep them functioning and to dispose of the remains when they become obsolete, and to procure the materials necessary to build new machines. In short, all in service of machines. With the idea, no doubt, that machines are fundamental, the only truly useful thing, the all-encompassing solution. But what about the rest? Those needs that aren't immediate, that aren't practical or distinctly material, and yet are no less urgent. The so-called spirit, memory, imagination, creativity, depth, complexity. And what about the larger questions which are common to other essential domains of knowledge, including biology, physics, philosophy, psychology, and art? Where and when did it all begin? Where do I go? Who am I? Who are others? What is society? What is history? What is time? What is language? What are words? What is human life? What are feelings? Who is a stranger? What am I doing here? What am I saying when I speak? What am I thinking when I think? What is meaning? Interpretation, in other words. Because without interpretation there is no freedom, and without freedom there is no happiness. This leads to passivity, a tacit acceptance of even our brighter moods. One becomes a slave to politics and the market, driven on by false needs. Then there are those, perhaps a smaller group, who maintain that Latin does in fact have a purpose. Latin, according to this camp, teaches us how to reason and instills a certain discipline, which can then be applied to any other task. So Latin is just like math. I can tell you how many times I heard this growing up and how often I hear it still. They defend Latin by granting it the merits of other branches of knowledge, while ignoring its own unique merits, 
without recognizing that Latin offers something that math can't offer, just as math offers, offers things that Latin can't. Neither argument, that of the usefuls, um, if I may say so, nor that of the uselesses, is quite what engenders and nourishes a love for Latin. The objection given by uselesses is just as weak as that of the usefuls. The lat that Latin's purpose is to train the mind. Its rich morphology for jogging the memory, its syntax for stimulating our logical deductive capacity, and so on and so forth. All true, but if Latin is this alone, an exercise gym, it would all the same to it will be all the same to study other complex languages like German, Russian, Arabic, or Chinese, which have the added uh, advantage of being still in use. And would an algebra serve just as well to reinforce our memory and logical skills? Or chemistry? Even a mystery novel might do the trick. The frail argument offered by the usefuls has for decades helped to prop up shaky pedagogical and rhetorical methods, only adding fuel to the fire of the uselesses. The structure won't hold anymore. No, the study of Latin, demanding, challenging, exhausting, and like a good hike through the mountains, restorative and in and of itself, must not be treated like a cognitive boot camp. Next, we'll be going to the Louvre and to the Metropolitan Museum or to the National Gallery to sharpen our vision and to La Scala to improve our hearing. <laughs> Divers and ballerinas have beautiful physiques, no doubt, but they've built those muscles so they can dive and dance, not to look at themselves in the mirror. When we study Latin, we must study it for one fundamental reason because it is the language of a civilization, because the Western world was created on its back, because inscribed in Latin are the secrets of our deepest identities, secrets that demand to be read. One other minor contention against the usefuls and the uselesses, Latin, I say, is beautiful. Beauty is the face of freedom. What all totalitarian regimes have most strikingly in common is their ugliness. This has been told by some very good writers, which spreads to every aspect of, and form of life, even to nature. And by the adjective beautiful, I mean to say that Latin is various, malleable, versatile, easy and difficult, simple and complicated, regular and irregular, clear and obscure, with multiple registers and jargons, with thousands of rhetorical styles, with a voluble history. Why, we, why give ourselves practical reasons for encountering beauty? As you probably noticed, I'm using beauty in a very Aristotelian sense. Why impede ourselves with false arguments about comprehension? Why submit ourselves to the cult of instant access, of destination of a journey, of answers at the click of a button, of the shrinking attention span? Why surrender to the willless, the superficial, the defeatist, the utilitarians? Why not see that behind the question, what's the point of Latin, perhaps posed unassumingly, rests of violence and an arrogance, an assault on the world's richness and the greatness of the human intellect. I would like to put you on guard against one more no noxious cliché. Even among specialists, one hears the term dead language thrown around. This metaphor, uh, well, quite a dignified one, arises from a misconception of how languages live and die, and a hazy distinction between the written and the oral. Oral language is linked immediately with the idea of being alive, but this is a bias. Latin, even if it's no longer spoken, if we don't take, of course, my Italian, French, Spanish, you know, as derivations of Latin, and therefore, as you know, ultimate transformations of Latin itself, 
is present in an astounding number of manuscripts. And writing, particularly literary writing, is a far more durable means of communication than any oral practice. If therefore Latin lives, lives on in the most complex form of writing, we've yet imagined, namely literature, is it not absurd to proclaim it dead? Latin is alive, and it's more alive than what we tell our friend at the cafe or our sweetheart on the cell phone in exchanges that, that leave no trace. Think of this on an even larger scale. In this very moment, the entire planet is jabbering, amassing an immeasurable heap of words. And yet, those words are already gone. Another heap has already formed, also destined to vanish in an instant. It's not enough that the speaker is living to say that the language he speaks is alive. A living language is one that endures and produces other languages, which is precisely, precisely the case with Latin. And I'm not referring to the Romance languages, which were born from spoken Latin, or to the massive contribution of Latin vocabulary to the English lexicon. What I mean to say is that Latin, as literature, has inspired the creation of other literature, of other written works, and as such, distinguishes itself from other ancient languages, those which, even with the written record, are truly dead on the page, since they served in no way as a model for other languages. Dante would never have composed his comedy without the model of the Aeneid, nor Milton his Paradise Lost. Machiavelli could not have written his discourses on the first ten books of Livy without Livy's history, nor Castiglione his book of the, court, of the Courtier without the paradigm of Cicero's De Oratore. Shakespeare's beginning would be inconceivable without the influence of Ovid's metamorphosis. We could fill hundreds of pages with such examples, coming from every age, even our current one, and from every cultural tradition on earth. Written Latin gradually became the voice of the past, and this voice struck up a dialogue with posterity. And there's no truer or more moving representation of this conversational power, I believe, than Machiavelli's letter to his friend Francesco Vettori, very famous celebrated letter. Machiavelli, having been expelled from the world of politics, describes the consolation he finds in reading the ancients, but reading, in this letter becomes an exchange, a dialogue, and it takes on the appearance of a real physical encounter. Here, the books stand in for the authors, alive and well, and well despite their temporal remove, and his study becomes the magical space of an initiation ritual. Uh, let me read you just um, a few lines in an English translation. One prop once properly attired, I step into the ancient courts of ancient men, where I, uh, where a beloved guest, I nourish myself on that food that is mine alone and for which I was born, where I speak to them without inhibition and ask them the reasons behind their actions. And in their humanity, humanitas, Humanita is the Italian word, they reply. And for four hours I feel not a drop of boredom, think nothing of my cares. I am fearless of poverty, unrattled by death. I give all my, I transfer all myself to them. One's encounter with the ancients, we note, even has its own dress code. Hmm? once properly attired. It's not a private matter, but a public ritual. Note also that Machiavelli calls this encounter a dialogue, a metaphor, a metaphor of course. Not a fly could be heard buzzing in this study, I would imagine, and yet that silence has all the power of a real verbal exchange, resounding and alive, though bound within the perimeter of his mind. However unique Machiavelli's conversation appears to be with the ancients, we all do something similar when we approach a classical text. We make tradition continue. 
our very act of reading is not simply a private practice, but it posits itself within the overreaching temporality of cultural transmission, which takes centuries. By reading and translating, um, in my vocabulary, reading means translating, we are not just living today, we are living in history, transcending our biographies and entering a much broader chronology. But we must also remember that the culture to which Machiavelli belonged, the Renaissance, was profoundly Latin. Indeed, the Renaissance came about as a direct result of the revival of Latin antiquity, developing in strict dialogue with its texts, even when the authors chose to express themselves in the vernacular. To be sure, Latin was crucial also to the development of vernacular literature before the Renaissance, and to some extent we could even claim that there's a revival of the Latin classics in the Middle Ages, uh, that is before the times of Petrarch. Dante is a case in point. His Divine Comedy could have never been written if Dante, the author, had not elected the pagan Virgil as a teacher of his textual double, Dante the Pilgrim. Though Dante remains an exception in his century and his relationship with the Latin classics is conditioned by a strict Christian censor, the fact remains that the father of European vernacular literature conceived of his poem as a companion piece to Latin's greatest epic. Today, more than ever, the Divine Comedy strikes us as a magnificent and exemplary fusion of ancient and modern. Over the course of the 15th and 16th centuries, science grows in influence, religion's grip on society weakens, and even in persistently Christian climate, a passionate interest in rediscovery takes hold, giving new clarity to the once clouded perception of antiquity, a, a more historical understanding of, of distance. The recovery of Latin texts becomes a field of study in and of itself, bringing about shifts in pedagogical thinking and literary taste, and elevating grammar to the science of sciences. One thinks of Lorenzo the Magnificent and of Aldo Manuzio's editorial work and publishing work, founded entirely on the spread of Greek, Greek Greco-Latin antiquity. A new religion sweeps the world, one might say, a perfectly human religion, one of textual precision and purity, a cult of the word as a living, evolving trace of man's existence. The university, the library, the private study all rise to the level of sanctuaries. Texts are carefully analyzed and annotated, come through for even the subtlest glimmers of meaning. The interpreter bows humbly before the author's complexity, allowing it to resonate, as exemplified in the Florentine lectures held by Agnolo Poliziano, one of the most brilliant minds that Europe has ever produced. Whether annotating Perseus' satires or Virgil Georgics, he scrutinizes each and every word or expression that he deems worthy of consideration, determining its exact meaning and textual form. His preferred method is to illuminate a single linguistic element by turning to passages from other ancient authors, even those distant in time from the author being analyzed. He situates and considers each individual word within a network, a civilization or a tradition, and only there can its true meaning emerge. It's not <clears throat> Sorry, it's not a case of establishing, as did Dante, how Christian Virgil already was. With Poliziano, the task is to establish who the author in question truly and specifically was, what the words of the Latin language mean in relationship to ancient culture as a whole. No longer is it the search for oneself in the other, but for the other as a other, as a historical product, perfect and beautiful in his historical completeness.
Beauty and truth become one, to put it in John Keats' words. In, this, in his letter to Vettori, the, ones, the one I, I just mentioned, Machiavelli reveals a respect for the ancients on a par with that of Poliziano, if less technical. Knowledge is described as food or nourishment, a source of life. But what's most striking in the letter above is the verb trasferire, to transfer, to cross over, that need to enter the world of the ancients, the very opposite of the desire to hold them into the future age, or to the, the present just. To enter into contact with the ancients requires a crossing over, as clearly indicated by the preposition trans. This is an effort to understand historically, to step out of, its, of oneself and approach the other. Only then can the past take on meaning and give pleasure. Mere pastism and an inability to live in the present? Not at all. In the next paragraph of the very same letter, Machiavelli goes on to describe his work on The Prince, one of the most innovative texts of all time. In fact, he even intends to intervene in the present with this treatise, providing drastic to solutions to the current crisis. But most of all, Latin is alive in what we, the living, read and translate, and in the work done at schools and universities. Literary Latin has never been a spoken language. No literary language has, in truth. Who among Cicero's contemporaries spoke the way he wrote? Nobody. Not even Cicero himself, who carefully went back over to the, 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 the manuscripts of his speeches, <clears throat> of the speeches he gave in court. And what about even a more modern writer like Henry James or Virginia Woolf? Can you imagine a contemporary speaking in such sentences? Let's meet at the angle, instead of at the corner. Or literature, if we're using the criteria that a language must be spoken, is dead. Because it is art. And so it is construction, calculation, style, like music or painting. Notes and colors are everywhere around us. But Beethoven's Ninth or the Sistine Chapel won't be found except in the unique combinations given to them by an individual through brilliance and intention, selecting and arranging each element according to a precise plan. Virgil's Aeneid is no different from Beethoven's Ninth, and the same is true of all great literature, ancient and modern. Who would ever mount an argument against reading Proust in the original on the basis that spoken French is a different language? Some might object that literature is filled with regular speech, everyday speech. But let's dispose of yet another misconception, that literary dialogue is the speech we hear in real life. Literary dialogue is a simulation of speech. The very moment that speech or a spoken expression enters the realm of artistic writing, it changes in value. It becomes style and not the spontaneous expression of a living language. Dialogue can certainly add color, it can be ironical, it can create the illusion of reality, etc., etc., but it isn't speech, not in the empirical or socio-historical sense. I'm approaching my conclusion. <clears throat> Literature is life, and it lives because it generates more writing and because readers exist, and because interpretation exists, which is a dialogue between thought and the written word, a dialogue between centuries, which holds time on its ruthless march and continually renews our potential for permanence. To label as dead a language that's written but no longer spoken is to deny the power of reading, to misunderstand how knowledge operates, even more, it is to commit an act of violence, a hair-brained and arrogant act of violence, like burning down the National Gallery or the Metropolitan Museum. You're dead because I don't believe you're alive, 
because it doesn't matter to me that you're living, and so I'll bury you without a thought for your echoing voice. But the dead and dying are those who don't listen, not those who speak. And violence done to another turns automatically into self-flagellation and self-destruction, because to not listen is to empty oneself, to flatten out, to grow dull, to disappear. It's true that this self-destructiveness instinct, this, this self-destructive instinct is part of the human condition, as any number of TV shows will attest. Well, literature helps to contain this instinct. Literature preserves our capacity for peaceful and respectful relationships, without which nothing else can survive. The name that Latin gives to this capacity is humanitas. We saw it in the letter by Machiavelli. And those who possess it, humani. Both of these terms, which are derived from the Latin homo, human being, appear with great frequency in Cicero. Humanitas can even be specifically understood to mean literature, to court. Literature being the space in which we express spiritual nobility through linguistic excellence. The present indifference toward Latin, though not universal, and often the rejection and boycott of the language, even from on high, even from within, are symptoms of a systematic attack on literature and on the function that literature has traditionally served and is still quite capable of serving, better than any other form of knowledge or communication giving order and meaning to the human experience through story and metaphor, broadening the scope of the visible by imagining potential worlds, forming and disseminating paradigms of thought and action, representing ideas and modes of living that are still resistant to or already exist beyond institutionalization, giving form to feelings and emotions and moral values, reflecting on justice and beauty and constructing cultural poles out of otherwise distant and fragmentary communities, and not least uplifting a national language to the level of art. And in doing all this, allowing, allowing for a particular kind of pleasure, the pleasure of understanding through interpretation. Literature in any language is rarely ascribed such responsibility and such dignity today. High school and university programs have withered, students are reading less and less. As for the good of society, our mental health, the beauty of sentences, as for the education of the spirit, in other words, we no longer seem to give them any thought, betting all our happiness on material wealth. And so our taste decays, along with our expectations. Our words turn anemic, signifying less and less, sounding more and more, like white noise, like traffic, or certain politicians. Words, our greatest gift, our most fertile ground. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you for this a uh, fascinating panorama in which you spoke of Latin's multidimensionality. You spoke of the stratifications of our culture, uh, in which Latin is deeply embedded at many different levels, often unbeknownst to us in our conscious imaginings. Um, I think what we'll do is I'll ask you a few questions and then we'll offer the floor to the audience. And I wonder if I could, I could talk to you a little bit about this distinction about living in dead languages. And I thought I could, we could return to a period that you covered at one point in your talk, the period of the 15th century in Italy. Right. In that century, there is a debate that goes on. And the debate really is around this one question. Uh, this is a debate among Italian thinkers who are passionately attached to the idea of classical Latin. What they want to do is they began to see a few generations earlier in the lifetime of Petrarch that the Latin in use in the church 
um, didn't match the Latin of Cicero and other ancients. It didn't seem the same. So how do, how do we do this? How do we write like classical thinkers and so on? So as part of this enthusiasm, they start having a debate over the question, what sort of language did the ancient Romans speak? In other words, did they speak like they wrote? Were they like us? Meaning, did they have a separate vernacular and then did they, did they need schools and institutions to learn Latin and so on? And through it all, there was a polarity that occurred. And the polarity was about how to describe the Latin language. And two terms are often used, sometimes subterraneously, sometimes on the surface. One term is the term an artificial language, a lingua artificialis. The other term is a natural language, a lingua naturalis. And the idea of the one, which characterized a lot of belief about the language during the Middle Ages, the artificial language, was that Latin was a language of the Latin word ars, art, which means craft, which means precisely that it's not natural, that you needed schools to learn it, you needed institutions to foster it, and so on. And then on the other hand, you start to have thinkers wondering. These Renaissance thinkers, as you know, were passionate about ancient sources. So as they debated this question with each other, they kept digging into more ancient sources. They found, for example, a source like Quintilian, who wrote his oratorical education. And Quintilian says, parents should make sure their nursemaids speak Latin correctly. All right, so this becomes a clue for them that, uh-oh, this was actually a spoken language. right? This wasn't just a written language. They talk about theater. How could people un have understood comic plays right. if, you know, if they didn't understand the language, if we know that these were not literate, meaning writing people? All of a sudden, if we fast forward to the year 1450, I think a seminal and important moment occurs. And that's when two of these Renaissance figures who, as you know, many of these people were very contentious. They were always arguing with each other. So two of them, one was Lorenzo Valla, um, who was active, um, died in 1457. The other is Poggio Bracciolini, who was a little older than Valla. Right around the year 1450, they engage in this debate together. And Poggio, in one of his responses, Poggio was a, a, a great lover of the Latin language. He was also a bureaucrat. He was a secretary at the papal court. He was the Florentine secretary. He had other different political offices. But he was a very prolific Latin author in the 15th century. And at one point, he said uh, in, a, in a vitriolic oration against Vala, you know, Vala, um, usage has always been the master of how to enunciate, how to speak Latin correctly. And then he says this. He says, usage is found only in scriptis et libris antiquorum, only in the books and writings of the ancients. And he doesn't quite say Latin is a dead language at that point, but he, he gives a little bit of oomph to the idea. If we fast forward again to the year 1540, we find a Venetian thinker named Alessandro Cittolini who's arguing in favor of the Italian vernacular. And in order to make the case that the Italian vernacular should be thought of as the, the modern language, the language we can use, the language we can infuse with all of these properties of permanence and durability that Latin was thought to have, Cittolini says about Latin, he says, la Latina lingua è morta e sepolta nei libri. It's dead, it's buried in books. And so there's this idea that um, I think what you alluded to at the end, that Latin as a consciously literary structured language, even by those who would claim it's a dead language, it almost itself serves as a model of how you can write permanence. Because really, that's what these humanists are really debating about. Like, what kind of language? We, we know that vernaculars right, are different in every decade and every place. You know, you right. go to Milan, it sounds different from Naples. Right. Decade by decade, words change. Latin somehow seems to right. have this generative power. So I wonder what you think of that debate and how, and how we can bring it in now. Because right. what we don't want to do is we don't want to be unrealistic about Latin now. So I'm interested in your thoughts. Uh, yeah. yeah um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Celenza. Um, well, um, in Italy, the, the debate was particularly fiery and, and, and um, vitriolic because, um, you know, Italy did not exist as linguistic unity. Um, and, um, you know, it may sound uh, strange to us today, but uh, Dante and Petrarch before 1525, especially Petrarch, uh, and Boccaccio before 1525, were not enough to yes. support this linguistic unity. You know, it, it took a guy whose name is Pietro Bembo yes. um, to say, well, you know, let's forget about Latin. Uh, we have enough tradition in the vernacular to construct um, a literary language for everybody who wants to be a poet or a prose writer. Dante was excluded because too complex, too, 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 too 
uneven and, yes. and too creative, too creative. Um, so uh, the, the debate um, took on uh, th this aspect, this, um, um, the form of a quarrel, especially in Italy because of this lack of, of a national language for writing. Um, and the, the many spoken tongues in Italy were too many to, uh, to create a koine, we may say. No? Um, now, uh, Bembo, in fact, is a case, is a very good example uh, um, because he started as a great defender of Latin writing, as he was a poet in Latin. Mm. Well, he kept Latin even, you know, for a long time he also wrote a history of the, of the Venetian Republic in Br Latin. Brilliant Ciceronian Latinist. He was even named a papal secretary. Right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah, an amazing. Mm. But he, he actually is the very uh, guy who at some point said, basta col latino, let's move to, to the vernacular. But it's interesting because he basically what he, he did was applying exactly the same um, canon-based pattern as used in Latin to the creation yes. of an Italian literature. So just like you have Virgil in Latin poetry and Cicero in Latin prose, so do you have Boccaccio in Italian pro for Italian prose and Petrarch yes. for... Uh, so in that particular case, um, Bembo, Bembo was very clever. He's, probably one of the most ingenious uh, you know, l l critics ever, because he very elegantly and very quickly resolved that impasse, yes. uh, you know, what Latin, the, be the best author, just Cicero, or as many as we want, is Latin dead, is Latin alive? Yes. You know, he kind of, you know, with one just <laughs> cut, um, got rid of that knot by saying, but we have our Latin, that is, we have our own Italian. Already, so um, and in, in in a way he you know got out of some you know dead end by by equating whatever was available in in in, in the vernacular with what yes. had been transmitted in Latin. But he then created another snare because then Italian literature literature stayed trapped in Petrarchism yes. Yes. and Boccaccism for centuries. Yes. And whoever actually attempted a different way yeah. fell off the chart. Yes. So, you know, a lot of you know, different Italians as, as languages were practiced indeed, yes. but they were not in fact considered after it Italy finally became a, a unified country. Yes. Uh, and so the Santis imposed yes. the model in 1860, which stayed. And, only now, and also thanks to the, the work of foreign acad um, academies, yes. are we opening up the canon yeah. and understanding that Italy is just many Italies, yes. and, and that's why we love Italian culture, that, that's why we need to know more and more about it, and that's why we need to uh, uh, de ossify yes. such paradigms to see more behind them. Um, I'm not sure I'm answering your question. Well, let me, just, well, let me ask you a follow-up. <laughs> let me ask you a follow-up on this, and then we can have our audience um, ask questions too. You know, you mentioned Pietro Bembo, this this Venetian cardinal who writes this multi very influential work in 1525 called the Prosa della Vulgar Lingua. One thing he says there is that as Greek was to Cicero in the ancient yeah. world. Like Greece, Greek was a second language to Cicero. He says Latin is that way for us. Right. So he still presupposes, exactly as you say, that there was some kind of model there that you learned right. from. Even earlier, um, Leon Battista Alberti, the polymath, wrote the first grammar of the Tuscan language called the Grammatichetta, right. and he does it based on Latin paradigms. Yeah. In other words, he uses the Latin. But that that's a assume. that's a national problem. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> no, it's truly it's ingrained in the Italian mind, if there is one Italian mind, you know, to follow models. It's yeah. a very because th this you know courtly culture, because we're speaking here of you know yes. very narrow circles that ended up dictating rules for everyone. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, and yeah. I mean, we're talking of Italy, but we are talking of a few guys. Yes. Very few women, none till a certain point. But, um, but another, uh, you mentioned Vala, but the other, yeah. the, the, the other problem was actually sounding elegant. You know, the, the problem of, you know, using a dead or a, or a living language was one, but another one was using 
a, a, a nice medium yeah. Yeah. or just a, you know, a sloppy one. And another, for example, interesting quarrel is between Pico and uh, Hermolao Barbaro. Barbaro yeah. Pico, the famous guy you know, with, with this, this uh, immense uh, memory, um, who was also uh, quite, a, quite a, very, uh, a very good writer in Latin, was though very much against you know, this purism of some, like Hermolao Barbaro, who would, say, who would claim that no philosophy can actually be written uh, if not in a very elegant medium. Mm. And uh, Pico brought in another interesting issue in, in whatever, in this debate, by saying, I mean, you're fine, you know, elegant Latin is, is a beautiful thing, but don't forget that truth mm -hmm. can be expressed in any language, even in yeah. Arabic. Yeah. It's an amazing yeah. passage because yes. You know, speaking yeah, yeah, of, you know, that's... equating yes. every language, uh, putting every language on, on a par and saying that every language, even the non-classical languages, can, can say something true is just unbelievable. It's just, you know, a, a breakthrough, which remained quite unique, though. Yes. Um, because ultimately, this is Pico's point, languages are constructions. They're made up. Mm -hmm. They're, they're yes. made of, of conventions yes. that we fabricate, but truth is not fabricated. So fabricate whatever code you want mm -hmm. and express truth. You can do it in any language. So, you know, Latin, when we think of Latin, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to kind of yeah. bridge, again, uh, you know, towards what you said. Um, um, it's not just Latin. It means a lot of this yes, debating yes. about the nature of Modeling, language. Canons. Yeah. Canons, yeah. what to put there, what to use. Um, um, you know, I'm now busy translating, retranslating into Italian 1984 by Orwell. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 And I, actually, this morning, I translated a passage where a guy, one of those who like hangings and, you know, the gory, the gory things, uh, say, uh, who's a philologist, says, oh, it, by f um, the beginning of the 21st century, the language would be reduced to just to very few words. Mm, because yeah. why do we need opposites? <laughs> <laughs> you know? and, well, you know, Orwell, who's a very clever uh, writer, is in fact you know, telling us what you know, Latin, yes. and but not just Latin, all our, our, all our linguistic systems constantly face what to put in them, yes. how, how, how to think in the end, and how to think uh, modernly. Yes. Because we're all, in whatever century, in whatever culture, we're all engaged, committed to construct modernity. Either by harking back to some models, or by just demolishing models, or by saying that we can use as many models as we want, yes. Poliziano, or by saying we just need one model, you know, Bruni. Bruni. Bo uh, Bruni. <laughs> uh, uh, but we're all, you know, busy with the same preoccupation: yes. how to be modern. Yes. Let's open it up. Yeah. I'm sure people have questions. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm somewhat close to Latin because, of course, there are some Latin words that are commonly used throughout law. Uh, I, I have a good friend, and, and I thought you might appreciate this different use of Latin, um, who was the general counsel of Washington Gaslight, the local utility company. And when he filed a brief in court, and he always wanted to have it read. And so he always put in some Roman law because he knew all the judges wanted to read the brief to see what the Roman law had to say about this current fairly mundane uh, tariff case. And, and so it's got a lot of very interesting uses. Uh, I've also found it's got some humor. If, if I can't figure out how to explain something to a client, you know, I can say, well, I think we need to file maybe a writ of habeas mabius. <laughs> yeah, um, actually, lawyers, when my book, Long Live Latin, which, uh, which will appear soon in English, I mean, soon means October, uh, appeared, um, a few lawyers wrote me and they complained that I didn't include any, any law in my book, but I just wanted to, you know, focus on, on literature. 
which does not mean that literature doesn't have any legal you know, yeah. part. Um, uh, but um, to, to, uh, you know, to be fair to truth, um, law is probably one of the most um, Latin-oriented fields of, contempor of our contemporary culture. Be um, in indeed, uh, not only did I receive letters from those who complained that I had not <laughs> included enough law in my book, but some others, uh, for example, Spanish uh, lawyers um, and, and historians of, of Roman law invited me uh, to a, a conference back in, in, December, uh, in November in Salamanca, so a very nice university, and, um, and they asked me to, to provide a bit of, um, of rem uh, some remarks on, um, on, um, on Latin terminology. And because I felt very weak in law, I decided to, to, to use words that never made it into <coughs> law <laughs> definitively, like the word fas, which originally meant use, uh, law, um, yeah, law or right. Anyway, um, but um, in fact, it, what you said is, is, is very interesting because you seem to still believe that Latin is there to support, to uh, oppose semantic flux, mm. right? I mean, this can be used also detrimentally and, um, and also fascistically, and it's been done. Or, I mean, you don't need to necessarily evoke the awful ghosts of Mussolini, but if you just go back to a famous Italian novel, um, I Promessi Sposi, The Betrothed, there you find a lawyer who speaks Latin not to be understood by the poor guy who resorts yes. to him and yeah. wants to be helped. So the guy just leaves, you know, having obtained nothing from the lawyer, but knowing that he said something important that he had yes. no access to. The little passages of Latin in Machiavelli's Mandragola, his comedy, serve a yeah. similar function, right? That yeah, exactly. Kind of it would yeah. be interesting, actually, to, yeah. to make up an anthology of passages yes. where Latin is actually a tool of, of repression, yes. of, social, of social injustice, rather than the opposite. It is the language of use, of use, tizia, but it can be also you know, put to, to the opposite use, that of injustice. Anyway, yeah, we, I think we all share... And that, uh, this belief that Latin in the end, although it was a very varied language and very fluid and uh, you know, most diverse, we still th think of it and, and want and need to think of it as something fully formed and closed. Because much as we like transformation and metamorphosis and, and progress, we are uh, we feel threatened sometimes by the speed of transformation. And Latin seems to be there, maybe also ancient Greek, um, or, or art, museums, you know, to, to, to testify to the possibility of some endurance, that there's some paradise on, the, uh, on, the, on this earth before we die. And there are those who think that paradise can also exist after life. But if those don't believe in it, there is a paradise in life, and that's you know, the permanence of some artistic achievements. Latin is one. Yes. Any, any others? Oh, over here, yeah, Sarah, yeah. Thank you so much for your lovely talk. I want to go back to that opening where you had that long, lovely list of things Latin does and things that Latin is good for. And um, one of those things was that it uh, gives shape to our emotions or gives shapes to emotion. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about that, um, perhaps just more specifically. Um, and in the context of what you seem to be um, emphasizing in the talk generally, in terms of dialogue, how does Latin and the way it gave shape or continues to give shape to certain emotions, yeah. how is that in dialogue with the present or with your own experience even of living in the present? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you. Uh, well, I didn't give any, um, as you noticed, um, textual references because I didn't know how many people here know Latin uh, or are familiar with uh, Latin literature in translation at all. So I just wanted to stay as general as I could, uh, whilst though you know actually pr providing some suggestions. And I'm happy, of course, to uh, to be more specific now um, uh, while answering you. Um, well, Latin, um, 
uh, is the language of emotion in poetry, uh, in comedy, of course, um, in, in oratory. Uh, Latin, when I say Latin, you know, I give you at the very beginning a list of things that Latin does, and I was basically summarizing the best texts of Latin literature. That's what I was mm. doing when I spoke of physics. Of course, I was thinking of Lucretius's De Rerum Natura and Seneca's Naturales Questiones. I mean, you're spoiled for choice. Uh, a, lo a lot got lost, but a lot remained. And uh, so um, when you go back to Latin and some works in Latin, you learn how to word feeling and emotion. And um, I mean, you have famous passages like Dido's uh, mm. uh, uh, fury, furor, and you just don't take it as any word. Furor does indeed describe uh, a derangement, an emotional derangement, that would be also interesting to measure. It's in book four of Virgil's Aeneid, right? Yeah, Dido, book four. Dido's, yeah. Yeah, D Dido, the queen Agu of Car Agu Dido, the queen of Carthage, yes has just learned that Aeneas is abandoning her. Yes. She has helped him to, you know, to survive. And uh, she married him if, yes. if a marriage actually happened. Uh, it's unclear, but, you know, let's pretend uh, they were married. Um, and at one point he leaves her suddenly and with, uh, with no notice. Well, she loses her mind. But the, her, her, the loss of, of her mind is described very carefully and very minutely by Virgil. Um, there you learn how a, a, a woman, mm. a, a person, gets out of her mind yes. and what criteria Virgil mm. used yeah. to say this woman is going out of her mind or went out, out of her mind. So um, the word furor, of course, is a key word. But that word, then you can um, find in other occurrences, in other authors, and you will see, for example, that Catilina, the terrorist, mm. the guy who, according to Cicero, now everybody likes Catilina, and, and everybody says, no, Cicero was a monster. He was the monster. The good guy was Catilina. Yes. <laughs> you know, Roman historians, I know, are pushing this very, quite far, especially in, in, in the UK. But anyway, um, Catilina, Catilina was a terrorist. Fine. Wh and he had furor. Mm. So interestingly, the very same word which describes the derangement of a woman in love, who not only a woman in love, but a queen, who, whose mm. dignity has been stepped on, who's been betrayed in all possible ways, you, know, you, you realize that that you know, kind of mental state mm. is equated with that of a guy who uh, attacks the republic. Mm. Um, so actually, I'm very fond, especially as a, as a teacher of Latin, if I, I'm not one anymore, I used to be, but I'm very, um, per, I'm totally conv convinced that an easy access to Latin is the study of vocabulary. Mm. Um, of course, grammar is, is a wonderful world in itself. The study of syntax is really a wonderful field of, uh, of um, of knowledge, uh, to see how a sentence is constructed in Latin is really wonderful. But uh, you know that takes more time, and sometimes it may be frustrating. And if you don't practice Latin constantly, you will forget it quickly. But you won't forget roots. You won't forget etymologies. You will not forget terminologies. So I think that a good approach to Latin, and uh, coming uh, also to your question, um, and to uh, you know, uh, special vocabularies in Latin would be really to single out words that we should not just take as convenient words that you know, the, the author ended up using, but as terminologies, and put them you know, in relation to other occurrences. If you, if you read Propertius to Ovid, Ovid mm. is just inexhaustible as a source to describe you know, desire, uh, the, 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 the various nuances of, of, of um, lust. Um, Seneca, the, his epistles to Lucilius are, are just, you know, a treatise on Roman psychoanalysis. That's what it is. And um, so, uh, you mentioned Quintilian. Mm. Uh, 
for example, Quintilian, who I like Quintilian a lot, although, um, just like Poliziano, although others, you know, in the Quattrocento would say, no, Quintilian is a diminished version of Cicero, so why take the diminished version? Let's go back to the, the good one. Uh, that is Cicero. But Quintilian is great. And uh, Quintilian has, for example, a very interesting passage back in the middle of this you know, orat oratorial um, treatise where he talks about the loss of his child. Mm, yeah. He lost a child. A beloved child of yeah. his died. And you know, in this <laughs> very technical treatise, not just technical because he, he does tell us a lot about also, you know, Childhood. It's a program for education in a way. It's a right? program of, senses, and, and yeah. plus he tells us things that are completely unexpected. He devotes a lot of space to childhood, which is not something the ancients actually liked because children are, are incomplete human beings. They're, you know, growing. So all classical ethics rests on the construction of the full man. Hmm? Aristotle is a good case in point. Uh, but Quintilian is very careful to tell us children have different talents. They should be understood as different from one another. Don't make them do what they can't do because their natural gifts are, you mentioned lingua naturalis, lingua artificialis, but that replicates the the, 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 the eternal conflict between artifice yes and inborn qualities, ars and natura. Um, uh, Quintilian is, of course, teaching us an ars, an art, how to learn. Uh, he's teaching us how to speak well, how to write well, how to defend the court, and plus a lot of other technical things. But he never forgets natura. So speaking of emotions or you know, psychology in general, even that treatise, which you would just take as a very technical treatise, will reveal unexpected um, uh, aspects of, of human life, like ch children, children's life. Mm. Actually, you know, Latin uh, is there to, I mean, uh, we're just kind of, sometimes I feel like we're just beginning to understand how important it is because, <laughs> of course, it's an exaggeration, maybe it's just me. But, um, <laughs> but the more you read it, the more you know you can use it the more you can extract from it. Because a lot is, is implied. And so, yeah, you go back to Quintilian because you need to find quite a nice discussion on how memory works. Neurosciences is there also. There's a lot of neuroscience in, in Quintilian. Um, but then you realize that there's something on mourning, on losing one's child, I mean, uh, this is the, the most conspicuous, conspicuous example, um, and, uh, and many other things. Um, comedy is another way, you know, where do you learn uh, most ideally about fathers and sons at the beginning of, of uh, Latin literature? Plotus, Terence, go there. What does a son do? What, what does he think? How does he behave? I mean, literature, it really ritualizes psychological and emotional mm. uh, states. Um, and plus, because this ancient literature is very conservative, although, you know, it's not true uh, from another perspective, because Quintilian is not like Cicero, Petronius is not like Salus, Tacitus is not like Livy, whatever. But uh, this, this very strong faith in imitation made even Tacitus, who was so new, feel like he was being kind of in following in the footsteps of Cicero. I mean, however different an author could be, he still though knew he was talking to his predecessors, always. And that's why we have like a, quite a coherent corpus where it's totally fascinating and also easy to access constants and changes, mm. you know? Um, and you have to be subtle, though, because sometimes you, you, don't, you don't see it clearly enough. And that's why, plus, you know, the language is complex, and you need to go back uh, uh, 
constantly because, um, because the way meaning is constructed is not the, sa the same as we construct me as, as ours. Uh, and that's something also that we need to, to finally internalize. Latin is difficult because it's not meant to be easy. <laughs> it doesn't want to be easy. And plus, I mean, there's not just a different grammar, but sense is something that emerges gradually. Um, it's something that, or you know, Asian languages still do. I mean, you don't. If you tell a Chinese, I studied a bit of Chinese. If you tell a Chinese, what does such and such a word mean? He he says, I don't know. You've got to give me a sentence. Because you know the, the monosyllables are also quite similar to one another, so if you don't put them in a in a in a even if you pronounce them correctly, even even if you get the tone right, still you need to to give the sentence. Now Latin works very much like that. You need to have a complete sentence to see the the also the hidden relations between parts, and that's why you know. Sometimes you learn about emotions there where you wouldn't expect to find, to find much. But I would say that elegy is a place to go. Ovid is a place to go. Um, Tacitus, you know. You want to learn how emotions, fear. Tacitus is great. You know, where do you learn how the, the Romans were afraid in Roman, you know, imperial times? Tacitus. Suetonius would be one. So, um, I mean, sometimes you don't have a treatise on specifically on what we would want to, to, to explore and research directly, but you can extract a lot. Catullus, I mean, think of, for example, uh, that, that poem by Catullus um, um, about Attis, who castrates himself. You know, it's, an, it's, a, it's a famous ancient myth. Uh, Attis, uh, you know, uh, goes through a frenzy, a furor, uh, loses his mind, cuts his genitals, and he finally wakes up, and he's not a male anymore. He's lost his identity. But the read through the line, Catullus is not telling us how to become a castrated person. He's telling us how to regret not belonging to the society you used, you used to belong to. And then you realize that that the, the horror Attis goes through is the horror of having been expelled from the community of, of men. Indeed, he mentions the gym, he mentions the square, he mentions all places of power, not of sex. He's not saying, oh my God, what, what is my girlfriend going to think now? <laughs> or my boyfriend, of course. Um, so, um, sorry, I could go on and on. <laughs> Well, I'm, maybe why don't we take one more question? Um, yeah, yeah, one of the things that, oh, thanks. One of the things that really fascinates me about Latin is how the authors use the word order to punctuate their writing. And it seems to me that that punctuation in the writing itself is reflective of their thinking. And um, yeah. I find that when I'm reading a very difficult author, if I read it out loud, I'm able to go in rhythm which author? Oh, any difficult um, author. Um, you, you definitely have a point there. Um, the, um, a few days ago, I was in uh, Venosa, where Horace was born. Every year, they have a competition with students. It's it's a certamen, so they translate a passage, and there's a there's a winner. And I was invited to give a lecture, and I worked on. Um, on an ode, the last ode of the second book by Horace, where the poet describes himself um, as being transformed into a swan. Hmm? So he becomes a, a swan, that is, the poet by excellence. No? He, Horace, for example, um, uh, compares Pindar, the most important Greek lyric poet, lyrical poet, to a swan. He starts the poem and says, you know, with an, with the, uh, non usitata, with unusual wing and not uh, a weak one, I soar, 
uh, and you know, leave the cities behind. I'm, you know, I go away. Blah 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 blah. But the word order is amazing. That Horace is a very good example of what you just said, because he says before miss, with two forms, be form, by formed. That's the adjective, though, of a, of a noun which does not appear till the beginning of the next line. And what's the word that this before miss must be? be attached to, poeta. Mm. But this is very, very beautiful because before miss means monstrosity. No? The ancients were terrified by hybrids, metamorphosing objects, um, you know, human beings, or because there's no identity, because you're two things. You, you have to be, you must be one thing. So he basically tells, I'm turning into a swan, I am both human and, and beastly. But then he will attach the most dignified word to that awful adjective, mm -hmm. which Virgil will use for monsters, mm -hmm. poeta. And that's such a surprise. It, it reverses yeah. things. So you have kind of become horrified when you read before me, and you remain you stay horrified till the end of that line, but then, poeta, ah, then, well, you may say to him, the poet is a monster, but because we know how much he cares for the title of poeta, being a monster is a merit. And that's a very good example of how, you know, the position of a word change, you know, creates a complete surprise when you come to the next line. And this distance has made us go through an emotional change. Mm. So that in the end, our horror was ungrounded because he's just telling us he's turned into the best yes. form, that of the poet. Mm. That's a very good example. Wonderful example. Well, why don't I suggest two things? First. We'd like you to continue that we'd like to continue this conversation over a glass of wine, so please feel free to join us at a reception. And second, just join me in thanking Professor Gardini for this stimulating. Oh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.